One of my biggest struggles growing up was humanizing Jesus. And what I mean by that is I was always taught that Jesus is God who took upon flesh. He looked like a human, he talked like a human, he walked like a human, but in my seven-year-old brain, that was still God. Underneath all that skin and bone, that's still God. See, I struggle to understand Jesus because this is a man who cannot sin, he can do the extraordinary, he can raise the dead back to life, open the eyes of the blind, and he could cast out demons. So I would constantly ask myself, how can this man, who is really God, understand me? How can he know my pain? How can he know my struggle? How could he understand the burdens of being human? Because even during Jesus' time on earth, he lived a perfect life. But see, just recently, God let me know just how wrong I truly was. The problem that I had growing up is that I lacked vulnerability with God. I didn't know how to be vulnerable in my prayers because I was afraid that if I told God how I truly felt, if I told God that reading the Bible doesn't make sense to me, your scriptures aren't hitting me like they hit everyone else. What I'm reading doesn't even make sense. I don't understand. I was too afraid to be honest with God because I saw that as speaking out against God. And I didn't want God to come after me. I didn't want God to strike me down. I didn't want God to kill me. See, when you lack an understanding of God's word, then you lack understanding of who God is. God wants you to be vulnerable. God wants you to be honest. Speak from your heart. God wants you to speak the truth. For as it says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, When you pray, don't ramble like the heathens who think they'll be heard if they talk a lot. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let your prayer be sincere. Let it flow from your heart. Let your prayers honor God, but let it be truthful. Let them be honest. Do not be afraid to have respectful conversation with God. I remember in second grade, I had a teacher and we were all intimidated by her. And every time she would teach us a lesson and we wouldn't understand what was being taught, we would never raise our hand and ask her for help. We were too afraid to tell her that we don't understand what you are teaching us. So instead of letting her know that we're not understanding what's being taught, we pretended as if we understood and we would do the assignments anyways. And she would come and she would check our assignments and she would realize we had not a clue what we were doing. And she would constantly reiterate to the class, if you don't understand the work, don't be afraid to ask for help. I will come around and I will assist you. See, there are many of us who are too afraid to be vulnerable with God. We read the scriptures and we don't understand what is being said. We don't understand what is being taught. We don't understand the message God is trying to get to us. So you know what we do? Instead of asking God for help, we constantly read the same scripture, the same verses over and over and over again, hoping that something might click in our brain. And then there are others who read over the verse, they don't understand it, and they move on. We must not be afraid to be honest with God. God, I don't understand what these verses are saying. I don't understand what the scripture is trying to tell me. None of this is making sense to me, God. What is it that you're trying to tell me, oh God? I want to know you more. I want to understand your word more. I want to go deeper in the word. Teach me, God. I want to know you. I want to know more. See, Jesus isn't just referred to as the Messiah, but he's also referred to as teacher. He doesn't just perform miracles, but he teaches. He gives wisdom where wisdom is lacking. He gives knowledge where knowledge is lacking. He gives revelation where revelation is lacking. If you do not understand the word of God, then ask the source. For as it says in John chapter one, verses one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. If you don't understand the word, then ask God to give you understanding. For as it says in James chapter 1 verses 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Do not be afraid to tell God, I don't know. I never truly understood Jesus. Because I always wondered, how could God take upon flesh, knowing that he is destined to die, but yet be so willing to sacrifice himself anyways? He could have made Moses the sacrifice. He could have made David the sacrifice. He could have made anyone the sacrifice, but he took it upon himself to lay down his life for all of us. I never understood it. And because I could never understand that, I never truly understood how much Jesus loved us until I read Luke chapter 22. See, Luke chapter 22 was a chapter that I've heard a thousand times growing up. I've heard it taught, I've heard it preached, I've even read it myself numerous amounts of times until God had revealed something to me that I had never noticed before. It was when Jesus went to pray on the Mount of Olives. In Luke chapter 22, verses 39, it says, And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. 
And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. What's so powerful about those verses is that Jesus prayed the prayer, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He prayed that prayer three times, but the second time that Jesus prays that prayer, he prays it a little bit differently. He says, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. See, I struggle to understand what Jesus meant by this cup, taking this cup from me. And that comes from a place of lack of understanding. And when you don't understand God's word, then you must pray and ask God to give you understanding. See, what Jesus is praying is that God, I know I must sacrifice myself for the people. I know that this needs to happen. But God, the time is coming. The time is near. It's, it's, it's soon happening. If it's not too late, God, can you remove this prophecy off my life? I know this is what I was born and bred to do, God. But God, right now, I am so filled with sorrow. I'm filled with fear. I'm filled with a little bit of regret. God, if it's possible, can you take the cross away from me? But if not, let your will be done. I was born in the church, went to church every Sunday, heard thousands and thousands of preachings, teachings, and hundreds of Bible studies. But for the first time in my years of reading scripture, I didn't see Jesus as God, but I saw Jesus as man. For the first time, I truly saw him. He was afraid. He had all these emotions going through him. Think about it. Jesus didn't have a lot of friends. From the moment he was born, he had to flee because a king was trying to kill him. His family was on the move. He was a carpenter. He didn't have childhood best friends. He wasn't popular. For a large portion of his life, he was a nobody from Nazareth until he came across a couple of men he saw out on the shore fishing for some fish. And it was in that moment that Jesus started to understand the concept of family, friends. Yes, Jesus had a family, but Jesus also knew that his father was God. His siblings always ridiculed him. Jesus was always out of place in his earthly family, always alone just like many of us, until the day he came across his disciples and he was given a family. And Jesus, he grew to love this family. He grew to love his disciples who were always around him. He went from having nobody to having 12 men following him around. He had Mary, Lazarus, Martha. He had all these people that he looked to as dear friends, family, and he built these strong relationships with him. He always knew that his time was gonna come and he was ready. But the moment, right before they came to take him away, he went to pray on the Mount Olives because he feels something that's gonna hinder him from his calling, from his destiny. And what he feels is sorrow. He feels regret, fear, because he always knew that his time was gonna come, but now that his time has arrived, he now must leave the family that he has built up, the friends that he has made. So he prays to God, God, if there's any way you can stop this from happening, stop it. But I know it must happen. So regardless of what I feel, let your will be done. I know I love my disciples, but I love your people so much more. I know I've made friends and family here. I have a life here. I've been alone all my life, and now I finally got a family. I finally got disciples, and I don't know if I'm ready to leave them behind. Not yet, at least. But if me dying has to happen so that these people, so that my family, so that the people that I've come across, the people I've healed, could live, so be it. What greater love than this, than a man who will lay down his own life for his friends. Jesus was afraid, but in his fear, Jesus prayed. And he didn't pray just any regular prayer. He prayed until he was drenched in sweat. They said that the sweat became like drops of blood. That's how hard Jesus prayed. When you are struggling to resist yourself, your desires, your lust, your temptations, your fear, your anxieties, you need to pray. That is why Jesus said, watch me to his disciples when he prayed on the Mount Olives. Watch how I pray. Watch how you overcome. This is how you overcome. This is how you overcome your desires. Watch me as I pray to my heavenly father. And you know what happened? An angel came and gave him strength, meaning that Jesus needed help because he was flesh. Yes, this is God, but he is in flesh. He's a man. So he feels and he struggles as a man. He's weak like a man. He can't take on his own desires on his own. We cannot take on our own desires on our own. So we must pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray until your sweat turns into drops of blood. We need to stay in the presence of God. Flee from the devil. And where you need to flee to is God's presence. And stay in God's presence until your desires, your wants, your lust no longer has a hold on you. I always wondered what it is that Jesus felt that day that they had beaten him so brutally and threw him on the cross. And after reading Luke chapter 22, now I know. Jesus felt sorrow. 
felt fear, he felt sadness, he felt pain. But he knew in order for us to live, it had to be done. Jesus didn't make just one sacrifice that day. He made two. He sacrificed the life that he made for himself on this earth. He knew his relationship with Peter, with Thomas, with all his disciples were never going to be the same again. He knew he was going to have to leave them for a little bit. And don't worry, he leaves them with a little parting gift, aka the spirit. But he knew he was going to have to leave them for some time. And that they were going to have to finish the work that he had started. But he knew he had to go. He sacrificed his wants, his desires, his fears, so that we could live. What greater love is that? If you're wondering, Jesus could still love you even in all your sin and shame. Just remember, he didn't just die for his disciples. He died for the prostitutes. He died for the murderers, the killers, the liars, the cheaters. And I believe that if it required of him to do it again, he will, without question. What greater love than this?